Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our third part of our three-part series on caregiving. And today's session is going to be Transforming Difficult Conversations. We will get started in about one minute. All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started. On behalf of the University of Louisville Traeger Institute and AARP Kentucky, I thank you all for taking time out of your schedule to join us today. Um, we are going to hear from Dr. Christian Furman, as well as Justin Magnuson today about transforming difficult conversations. And I'm gonna just turn that right on over to Justin. Thank you, Tahisha. Um, I appreciate it. <clears throat> Again, my name is Justin Magnus, and I'm with the University of Louisville Traeger Institutes. And Dr. Furman will be joining us um, shortly. She is um, working with patients today, so I, I know that sometimes she gets caught up in meetings, and you know it, it, it prevents her from being here right on time. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, I'm going to ask people if they have the ability in the chat if you could just comment um, what. Um, why you've been coming to these presentations. Are, are you a caregiver? Um, what is your role? And um, if you have, if you or your loved one has an advanced directive. So what your role is and if you and the people in your life have advanced directives. Um, I, 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 I used to call this conversation difficult conversations. And I'm really trying to reframe that in my mind because what I recognize is that there are there can be pauses and there can be um, discomfort and avoidance of this conversation, but really this conversation is about building intimacy and trust with the people we love. And I really wanna start reframing that in my own mind um, to really convey to people that this is a conversation that really builds relationships and really helps people focus on what matters most in their relationships. So we're gonna talk about a few um, key tips to having these discussions. Um, awareness of what contributes or prevents good discussions, um, how does this co um, connect to information in other parts of the series, and then we'll share some resources. So to start, I always talk about my personal connection to this um, information and, and to this topic. I don't come to the Traeger Institute with a background in social work or medicine. I, I come to the Traeger Institute with a background in community advocacy, particularly around end of life issues. And um, this is a picture, this is my favorite picture of me and my grandmother. Um, this is, comes from a grainy Polaroid. Uh, my grandfather's taking this picture. If you panned back a little bit, you would see Mount Rushmore in the background. And I'm probably about eight or nine years old in this picture. And so at this point in my, you know, in, in my relationship with my grandmother, you know, you would never think about having conversations around end of life decisions and advanced care planning. Um, as part of a conversation with an eight-year-old. But by the time I was 25, flash forward 18 years, uh, I was my grandmother's sole surviving next of kin. And I was one of her healthcare surrogates. And her primary healthcare surrogate, which is the person that would make decisions for her if she couldn't make decisions for herself, was my mother's cousin. And as luck would have it, my mother's cousin winters in Florida. And You've guessed it right. If you thought, well, gosh, if you know, she winters in Florida, when did my grandmother have her health emergency? It was in the winter when my cousin was there. So my grandmother, who lived alone in rural Indiana, basically drove herself to the emergency room on a Friday afternoon, um, actually a Friday evening. We'd had lunch earlier that afternoon. I, I was with her for three hours. She was able to carry on conversations. She was living at home. And when she drove herself to the emergency room that evening, we're not really sure why she wasn't feeling very well, but by Sunday, she was delirious. And that started my five week journey of being her healthcare surrogate with no advanced planning or discussions between us. 
So I really fumbled through the process and I've recognized that there were some opportunities leading up to that that could have reframed how we approached our conversations and how I could have been better prepared as her healthcare surrogate and, and caregiver to know how to make decisions and know how to really support her through the process and, and really to get support for myself as well, because I, I recognize that particularly, you know, caregiving is, is very challenging and not understanding how, you know, what decisions to make for someone or knowing what options or resources are available can be very challenging. So the importance of this conversation, uh, if you haven't had these conversations with someone in your life, with your loved ones, you're not alone. 92% um, of Americans say this is an important, you know, in the you know, discussion, but only 32% of the population has had this conversation. Now that number creeps up um, when you look at hospitalizations or people that are in long-term care, but still it, it, we are well below or right around half of all Americans having had this conversation, um, e even in people who are hospitalized. So we're very, you know, very, very low percentage of Americans have actually done this. So if you haven't done it yet, or you haven't reviewed this in a while, you're in good company. Most Americans have not. Now, 95% of Americans are willing to discuss their wishes and a little over half say it would be a relief. And this comes from the conversation project, which is a, a, a an organization and an effort to really engage people and reflecting on what matters most. And we'll talk about that at the end um, about some resources that you can get when you leave this conversation. So you can start thinking about, you know, how do I have this conversation? What really matters? And, you know, who are the people in my life that I should be sharing this with? So some of the benefits, um, some of the benefits are comfort knowing what you, you know, knowing you understand a person's wishes, um, the ability to plan and make, and, and this is really, you know, this conversation, all these series are around preparing to care. So planning this in, in advance um, takes away a lot of the, the stress of making these decisions when you're under duress or when the person in your life that you, that you really value can't make decisions for themselves. And um, it really can lead to avoiding potential conflict. Um, I'm really grateful in my case that my family was supportive of the decisions I was making, and I was never put in a position of having to fight with a family member to make a decision um, for my grandmother. But I hear stories all the time of people when they're really put um, in, in a challenging situation, someone may second guess the decision or cause distress. And the idea with these conversations is to ease that or, or to decrease the possibility of that and having things in writing and having things organized can really help mitigate that. So who needs to participate in this? Um, I, I, ideally, the, the patient themselves, if they are able to be part of this decision-making process, would, would ideally be participating in this way far in advance. And in my, in my case, I wasn't having this conversation um, when my grandmother was able, but ideally we would have been having this far in advance and, and reviewing this periodically. So as her health needs changed, I would be able to respond to that and, and adjust. But um, ideally the patient's gonna be involved, um, the power of attorney, um, which is a, a healthcare surrogate, which in the state of Kentucky would go Primary, and it would first go to a court appointed guardian if there is one, and then the spouse. Um, next would be the adult children, parents, and then other relatives per next of kin laws in Kentucky. Kentucky does not allow friends or pastors unless they've been appointed ahead of time to be part of this decision making process if the patient is unable to decide for themselves. And then ideally a physician of record and then other members of the healthcare team or other members of this person's um, broader network, such as friends, or friends, nurses, chaplains, social workers, really trying to have a broad base of support to really you know, flesh out this conversation and to make sure that, this, that things are you know, being expressed and shared and, and, and documented. And Dr. Furman, have you joined us yet? Yes, I'm sorry, can you all hear me okay? Yes. So you, do you want to briefly introduce yourself? 
Yes. So hi, I'm Christian Furman. I'm the medical director at the Traeger Institute and a professor of geriatric medicine and palliative medicine. I'm sorry, I'm at the nursing home today. So it just took me a little longer to get on, but um, I'm glad to be here and thanks for having me. Thank you. And so Dr. Furman, if there's ever anything that you would like to add, or, you know, if I miss anything, please, you know, please chime in. Perfect. Sounds good. And so the, the parts of this process, you know, are, are pretty simple. Um, this is a, a picture of an operating room and um, Ellen Goodman, the co-founder of the Conversation Project, which I, you know, I've mentioned, and I'll talk a little bit about that at the end. I, I really like how she frames this is, this is a conversation that's better had around a dinner table than around an operating table. And so, you know, ideally you're, you're, you're having this conversation, you're bringing this conversation up when people are relaxed. And um, I use a picture of very young people having this conversation because you know it is my wish that you know in in the future we we're, we're having these conversations across a lifespan, and so we're really engaging younger people in this conversation. And then as we age, or as our health needs or health wishes change, we are updating this. So we are bringing this up and eliciting um, the conversation early. Um, the second piece is really reflecting on what matters most to us and really who should honor those wishes. And this is, um, again, I'll, I'll give you some tools at the end that would really help with this reflection process. But this is really about focusing on what your values are, what information you have about your health and how much, you know, really you, you want to be involved. And so again, this is, you know, you're, you're bringing the conversation up to the people that matter to you and then reflecting on, you know, what matters most to you. Um, documenting this in the state of Kentucky to, to do a, a basic living will is very easy, um, but the documentation process it is, you know, really putting this down on paper and the communication of the people in your lives that are be, you know, making these decisions or part of this decision making process would be involved in that as well. And ideally, this is happening, you know, individually and then with your healthcare providers and your family members that are going to be affected by this. And then honoring this. And, and the honoring piece is that that documentation comes into effect when. The person that's on, you know, the, the patient that's involved is no longer able to make decisions for themselves. So either they they're in a healthcare crisis, or in the case of my grandmother, they were she was delirious. That person is no longer able to speak for themselves, and so those conversations and that paperwork is in place to really help you honor what matters most to them. And then reviewing this over time. And again, like my, my dream is that at some point we're having this conversation over a lifespan. And so you're reviewing this, you know, with major life milestones or with changes in health or just over, you know, periodically over the years. But for adults who are completing this or particularly adults that have, you know, chronic illness or, you know, a change in their healthcare status, they're reviewing this periodically. So they're more and more regularly. So if there's a change in healthcare or if they're being admitted or, or released from the hospital or a long-term care facility, you're, you're updating this over time. And really this is a, a more peri you know, a more regular conversation. So that person is in wishes are, are, are really current. I just so want to point out today, this has come up twice today at the nursing home. Um, and the, there's one healthcare surrogate that I talked to today who was so smart. He said, because I was asking him what he, what he thought, he's like, well, really, you know, it's not what I think, but I'm making decisions. He said this, the healthcare surrogate said, I'm making decisions based on what she would want if she could speak for herself. And usually I'm the one that's saying that. And I'm the one that said to him, what do you want? And it's not, we don't want to ask that question. It's not what the healthcare surrogate wants. It's what the patient would want if they could speak for themselves. So, and the other thing that happened today that just highlights what you just said, Justin, is that this patient does not want this feeding tube. She wants it out, but her daughter is not letting her get it out. And I think she will eventually let her get it out. But, you know, it's questionable. Can the patient make her own decisions or not? You know, so if the patient can make their own decisions, you don't need to be asking the healthcare surrogate. And so I think today when this happened, I just needed to reinforce to the daughter, really, it's not your decision. It's what your mom 
is saying what she wants. We just have to honor, like you said, you have to honor them. It's hard sometimes for the families to honor the patient's wishes because the family, of course, wants their mom to live. I mean, that's not the question. We all want your mom to live, but if she is dying and can't live, what's the, you know, what do we do then? So it's really a tricky situation. So when it comes to real life, it gets messy, you know? And so I think we all have to just remember to um, go back to the basics of it's what the patient could say. If they were awake and alert here and knew everything that was going on, what would they say? And, and so I am aware that, you know, I've, I've kind of thrown out a lot of information. If we were in person and I could all see your faces and I could see your body language, I could get a sense of how you're feeling about this. Um, and you can either unmute yourself or put it in the chat. Is there anything that comes up so far about how it makes you feel thinking about having these conversations or, or any questions? Okay, so again, this is really a, a conversation around honoring the wishes of the person in your life, or even yourself. I mean, I, I hope you're all thinking about yourself in, in, in terms of, you know, what are my wishes and how would I articulate this to someone in my life or my healthcare surrogates, but um, really, you know, articulating this in advance, reflecting on this, and, you know, having this as a conversation that, and really how we how we bring this forward if we're unable to speak for ourselves with the people in our life, both our loved ones and our provi healthcare providers know what decisions to make. Yeah, so, so, so Rita, you're chiming in that a couple of years ago you would have felt uncomfortable, but now um, you watch your parents and know that the conversation is essential. Um, so one of the things that I, I pass over in my story is that the last time I saw my grandmother when she was, you know, aware and able to make decisions for herself, you know, she was trying to, I think she was trying to have this conversation with me and I was uncomfortable. And, uh, you know, because I've seen what happens when you don't have the conversation so many times now, and I've lived through it, I, I'm much more comfortable now. And I have this conversation with my spouse and with my parents much more frequently. But um, Rita, if there's ever any, you know, or anybody else in the call, if you ever have questions or, you know, some kind of thoughts around, you know, something we're talking about, you know, please bring it up because, you know, there's, there's lots of ways to, to enter this conversation and you really do want people to be, com you know, as comfortable as possible and engaged and enrolled and really understanding why you're, you're bringing it up. So, so again, uh, uh, listening to this conversation, um, making the time, um, making the time is, is, the, is the first piece of this. And, you know, I, again, back to Ellen Goodman saying it's better to do this in, you know, around the dinner table than the operating table. You know, make, you know, if you're at home and you're comfortable or you're in a quiet, you know, you know setting with your healthcare provider, that, that's a great time to do this. When, when you're having, a, you know, the space and the time and, and you're not rushed and it's not loud and chaotic or, you know, un, you know not private, you know, that at the time is really when you can be in a pleasant setting. Um, deciding whom you want to be involved in the conversation. Um, I hear a lot of, of people when we, we talk about this, they, they, they come to this realization that maybe their spouse or maybe their, their sibling is not the right person to be involved as their healthcare surrogate. Um, and, and they really, you know, want to choose somebody else, either a close friend or a pastor or somebody, you know, maybe one of their only one of their children they want as their healthcare surrogate. So making sure that that person is is invited and understands what you know what you're going to talk about. Um, ideally, this is again before an emergency surgery or when there's been a chronic disease diagnosis. You know, ideally we're having this conversation years in advance, and then as you know health needs are changing, that's when we're having it. But it, it, but if you are, you know. In, a, in a, an emergency or a, a chronic disease, you know, situation, you know, you can start the conversation. It's never too late um, if the person can still share what matters most. And even if that person can no longer share what matters most, if you are their healthcare surrogate by law, you can be bringing this up with your loved ones and, and other people who care about this. So you can be making decisions um, and, and together and there are some doc there is some documentation that you can complete 
on that person's behalf if you are their legal healthcare surrogate. And so we'll talk about that a little bit in a while. Um, so how to elicit this? Um, when, I, when I did this with my family, um, I could feel the tension in the air when we all came together because they all knew we were there to talk about our advanced directives. And I just started by talking about, you all remember what it was like when I was grandma's healthcare surrogate and I didn't know what to do. And as soon as I brought it up, everyone kind of took a deep breath and was like, oh yeah, we remember that. And that is you know, one way to do it. Um, another way to do it is, you know, if you see something in the news or if you see something, you know, relevant to this and you see the, you know, particularly when this comes up in the news, it's usually very stressful for the people who are involved. And you can point to that and you can say, you know, I saw this story and it seemed really stressful for the, you know, for the, for the family. I don't want that to happen to me and I don't want that to happen to you. So, you know, making this relational is, is, can be a, a really big way to, to bring it up. And Justin, did you see in the chat? I, I'm just seeing it. Yeah. So, so your your husband was diagnosed. With, yeah. It, it, and and that is so. Yeah. I mean, that's that. I, I just you know, I my heart goes out to you. And you know, finding ways to have these conversations. And if you have children, or if you have other people that are really involved in this, you know, I, ideally you would be. You know, having this, you know, you would have had this conversation beforehand, but it's it's not too late to reflect. And I will give you some tools at the end that you can follow up on that can help you to think about values and and have this conversation to really, uh, you know, bring this forward and reflect on what matters most to the, you know, to everybody involved. And I think it's helpful for you to tell um, your personal narrative there because um, I just want to make sure I have your name, um, Alejandra, because because people think it's all theoretical, like, oh yeah, yeah, it doesn't really matter, but it's real life. I mean, in real life, being a caregiver and having a new diagnosis of a brain tumor, it's so stressful, just that period. But then to have to make all these decisions, if you already had the decisions made, it just takes one level of stress away. So yeah, I think that, I think the way you framed it, Justin, was good. Like no one wants to have these conversations, but here's why it's, it's better to do it now. I love that kitchen table versus the operating table. Too. <laughs> it's really helpful. And Justin and, and Dr. Furman, there is a question. This is being streamed on Facebook Live. So there's a question on Facebook that says, how do you have this conversation with your children when they state that they don't want to talk about it? So that's, a, Tahisha, I'm glad that you brought that in because that's a big, that's a big conversation. And, you know, when I was 25, again, my grandmother started talking about she, I think she tried to enroll me in the conversation and, and I just shut her down. I, you know, I was in a rush, I was busy, I was going to work. You know, I used that as an excuse, as a way out of it. And I, I think part of it is this, or, or this is how I frame it with, 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 with my peers. If I ask everybody on this call who your emergency contact is, there's probably, I, I hope everybody on this call knows who your emergency contact is. Who's the one person in your life that you would want, you know, called if you were in an emergency? And my assumption is this, if I can't call my wife, that means something's really wrong. And if I can't call her, somebody else is going to call her for me, would she know what to do in, in speaking for me? And I think that's, you know, I, I think that's how I frame it, but um, I, I think topical stories are one way to do that. Um, when you see it in the news, or if you see it in a story, one thing that we've that I've done, you know, as part of my community advocacy work, is couple this conversation with plays, or with movies, or with um, stories that are that are not real life. You know that, that you know that's something that you know we can all kind of look at a story and be like, gosh, what if I was you know, the patient or what if I was the loved one in this situation, how would I behave? And would the people around me know how to behave? And so that's one way I've tried to do it is, is tr try to, you know, bring forward ideas where people can see themselves as part of the story where it's not real life. It's a, it's a little bit, there's a little bit of a distance. So you can start the conversation that way, but um, you can't make anybody do anything. And so if your children don't wanna have the conversation, you know, talking to your best friend 
or talking to your spouse. Um, so at least you're having the conversation and doing this, this, this conversation with them, with somebody who will advocate for you. All right. That's um, what I would recommend too, Justin, is like, you know, you're, you can appoint a healthcare surrogate. It does not have to be your children. And maybe your children are not the ones. They really, that generation will change. They just don't see it. They don't understand how bad it can be sometimes, you know, because they're so young and um, nothing bad is going to ever happen. And so sometimes appointing, like you said, your best friend, maybe your best friend should be your healthcare surrogate and just leave your kids out of it, period. Maybe they just should not be the one. I, I, I will say though that you should at least let your children or you know your next you know whoever would be that logical person to be part of the conversation or, or it, at least let them know you know I've, I've selected my best friend to be my healthcare surrogate um, because I you know I can see that you're stressed about this and realize that can change so you know as 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 this convert you know and Ellen Goodman also says this that she wishes they called it the conversations project because it evolves. And so maybe the children aren't, aren't able to have the conversation right now, but at some point they are, or, or at some point they see the, the value of it. And so you, you've had the conversation with a healthcare surrogate, you know, that's not your children. And then over time you have a healthcare crisis. Um, so, so Don G, um, and, and I feel comfortable talking about this. So Don, most people in the way will know who Don G is. And I talked to her in 2016 and she talked on air. She was like, I don't have a, an advanced directive. Well, she had a stroke between 20, you know, the, our first conversation and our second conversation. And she was unable to respond when she was on the operating table or on the, you know, in the, in the hospital. And she, she heard her family fighting and that, that changed it for her and why it was important to have a healthcare surrogate. And, and, and she had one the next time we talked. And so even patients can come around to this conversation, but it does, you know, sometimes it takes time. And so maybe you revisit it over time and, and you bring it up to your children. Um, yeah, so sometimes it goes the other way. Um, yeah, and people don't wanna talk about it. And, and, and you, you know, this is about consent, really. I mean, this is about, you know, you're, you're, you're consenting to this. And so finding strategies to build that intimacy and vulnerability to have it if somebody doesn't want to, um, you just can't. So you, you know, you do the best you can and you inform yourself as both either a loved one or the patient and find people that you can have, you know, really as allies to support each other through this process if, you know, if somebody's not willing. So uh, 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 four broad potential treatment goals to consider. So as you're thinking about this, and thinking about someone speaking for you, um, if you can't speak for yourself or if you're speaking for someone else and they can't speak for themselves. Um, the, the first broad treatment goal is to, you know, to cure. So full treatment, you know, your goal is to eliminate disease. And you know, this is what we think about when someone's really robust and healthy. And you know, there's a really good chance if I break my arm or I get the flu at, at my current age, that you know, I could expect a full recovery. Even if I broke my hip today, uh, I could expect a full recovery. But if I was, you know, experiencing a chronic illness, or if I was, you know, was debilitated in some way, maybe you know, fixing that and curing that broken hip wouldn't be, you know, totally with, within the scope of reason. And so that second layer is to think about rehabilitation to so to restore, maintain, or minimize loss or function. So when my grandmother had her delirium, you know, they did a series of, of, of treatments and a series of procedures and rehab with the intention of restoring or maintaining her function. And, and, and the idea was to, 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 for her to go back home. Um, that is not what happened, but uh, you know, a lot of times that, you know, that's, the, that, that's the next way to think about this. It's like, you know, at this current age and this current level of health, if I broke my hip, I could probably expect a full recovery. Um, but you know, at some point, I may not be able to expect a full recovery, but I would be able to restore or maintain function and minimize loss of function. Um, the third level, and this is really thinking about, you just start to move into palliative care. Um, palliative care is not synonymous. It's not the same as hospice care. 
Um, this is really about comfort care and treating symptoms. It can be delivered alongside um, curative treatment, but this is really when we're talking about a disease that has progressed to a certain point where it, it's probably not gonna be cured. Um, you, you may not be able to totally restore and, um, function, but you are able to prolong life and really looking at the quality of life. So you can receive palliative care alongside curative treatment for sometimes long periods of time, but you're also recognizing that it's gonna take more robust treatment and there might be limitations that are part of that. And then this last um, broad treatment category is to think about comfort measures only. Um, and this is where, where the, the palliative care transitions into hospice care and you're really, making the person as comfortable as possible. You're really providing broad care that um, is, is, is treating both, and ideally the palliative care and the, and the hospice care are both providing care for the extended family. So there are resources that are not just going towards the patients, but it's really trying to provide more holistic care for the, the whole family or the whole system. And this is really focusing on moving away from curative treatments and moving more towards symptom management and, and comfort measure. And, and this is, it's still high level care, but it, it is again, letting nature take its course. And you, your, your goal is to, you're not trying to hasten death, but you are trying to minimize symptoms. And oftentimes hospice care can prolong life. It, because, it, because the treatment is not as aggressive as some curative treatments and that, that you're really focused on what matters most to this, the, the people involved and really providing care that is aimed towards supporting that. And Justin, I was just saying, um, we just talked about today, um, when we're talking about these four goals of care, um, it's nice to group it in four broad categories because sometimes I think physicians ask the family, do you want antibiotics or not? That's not the question. Um, people say, oh, do you want a tube feed or not? That's not the question. You know, um, do we do dialysis or not? That's not the question. The question is, do you want cure? Do you want rehab? What would the patient want? Would the patient want to be cured? We can't be cured. That's not the goal. We can't cure dementia, you know. The second rehab, well, we should always try rehab. We just had this conversation today the patient's already tried rehab once. And, and with this other patient we had, I mean, she fought rehab. She was demented, she was delirious, she was fighting the rehab. So you try, you can't do it. So then is it life prolonging or comfort focused? It's a broad category. It's not, do you want antibiotics or not? Do you want, it's not like a smorgasbord and the patient and the family just pick what they want. You, you kind of go over the broad goals of care. And then once they decide the broad goals, then you tell them what that means. Because a lot of times we'll people will pick hospice because they really like hospice. It fits their goals of care. But then you tell them what that means. You know, we're not going to do antibiotics, but we are going to do pain control and symptom control. And you're positive about what you are going to do. Not like, oh, we're going to stop this. We're going to stop this. We're going to stop this. It'll sound so bad, like no one would want it. So anyway, it's, it's tricky. And a lot of times when people are trying to choose between the life prolonging and the comfort focused and they can't make a decision, what I help people say is like, are they looking forward to a birthday, an anniversary, haven't got their affairs in order, not ready to die? If that's the case, then we should do life prolonging until they get their affairs in order, like they know who's going to take care of their kids or take care of the finances or whatever. And once they are ready, then we should focus on comfort, you know, because some people that I've had patients at the VA, I had a patient that was like, he's 90 years old. He was totally awake and alert. He's like, my daughter's gotten married. My grandkids have been born. I've done everything. I've lived a good life. I've served in the military. He's like, I've done everything. He's like, I'm ready to die. There's nothing that he's, you know, looking forward to. There's nothing, no event, no birth, no wedding. Nothing's coming up. He's like, I'm ready to go. I just want comfort. So it's, it's a hard conversation. And like you said, it takes time and it takes numerous conversations sometimes, but I think we as healthcare providers can really help um, relieve that burden from the families and, um, and the whole healthcare system if we do it right, if we don't just muddle our way through it and make mistakes and make things worse. So I, I've mentioned the conversation project a few times and uh, Lindsay and Lindsay, did I send you and Peyton? I, I think I sent you maybe the conversation starter kit. 
maybe I didn't send it to Peyton yet, but I'll, I'll, I'll put that in the chat at the end of the session so, so you can get access to that. But it, it's a really simple, um, easy to use process. But the first step is, is really getting ready. And that's part of the conversation that we've already had is, you know, for, you know, this kind of coming to the conclusion that yes, this is a conversation that's important and I, I, I'm gonna make a commitment to do this. The second piece is um, getting resources in, in line to think about this and you know a few of the very basic things out of the way in terms of thinking about values and thinking about really what matters most. The, the third piece is having the conversation. You, 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 you've set yourself up, you've, you've thought about this, you, you have the resources available and you start the conversation. And again, ideally this is you know, probably going to be conversations. It's probably going to be, you know, revisited several times and kind of getting comfortable with the idea. And maybe you wade into it. And, you know, you, if you get a sense that it's not the right time, or, you know, this is going to take a while, you can revisit this over time. And as I'm, and I'm saying this out loud, it's probably about time that I had this conversation again with my family. It's been a couple of years, you know, some of our health issues have changed. And so we want to, I want to bring it back up just so we're still on the same page and we're still thinking about what matters and, and, and how we're going to accomplish that. And then the fourth piece is, um, and, and, I, and I left it off the slide, is the documentation piece. And so at the end, I'll show you some of the documentation and, and it, it's pretty straightforward. So the conversation project and the documentation are, are, are really a continuum. The conversation project helps get the tools and the converse and, and the, the thought process in line to complete the documentation. And so, but these are some sample questions from the conversation project. And so this is, I think, really helpful, you know, as a patient, if, if you're thinking about this as the patient, you know, how much information would I like to know? Um, only the basics or all the details. Um, this is a conversation that my wife and I have had and I'm over here at a number five. Um, probably, I'm probably at number six on this scale. If, if there's anything that I you know, could know about my health, I wanna know it. My wife is probably more of a three or a three and a half. You know, she maybe doesn't wanna know all the details and that's okay. So people are, a, 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 if they're able ahead of time reflecting on this and thinking about how much information they would wanna know. Um, thinking about the level of care you would like Again, we just talked about the four basic levels of care. You know, this is basically, you know, getting you reflective. Like, you know, if I'm if I have a, a condition or if I have a situation, do I want to have um, as much autonomy in this as possible, or do I want my healthcare team to do what they think is best? And so, really going through this and, and, and having conversations around this can be really helpful because it takes away some of that ambiguity. Um, thinking about your privacy. You know, if you're at the end of your life, and this is a big conversation in hospice, um, you know, at the end of my life, I want to be surrounded by my loved ones or I want to be, you know, in a more private situation. I mean, that's a very individual conversation. And, you know, that's something that people really need to discuss ahead of time. And, and thank you, Peyton, for putting the conversation information in the chat. I appreciate that. Um, but the conversation, you know, starter kits, takes you through this process and it includes more questions than this, but each of these are really aimed to help think about what matters to you. And when we think about a healthcare surrogate, uh, a healthcare surrogate is a person identified to make healthcare decisions for the patient if, the patient if they lose the ability to decide for themselves. And so that is part of the reflection piece where you are reflecting on you know, who would best honor these wishes if I'm unable to speak for myself? And this is a, you know, again, people sometimes go through this process and they, all of a sudden they realize my spouse or my, my oldest child isn't the right person. It needs to be someone else who is going to be more removed from this and be more comfortable with this. And so, you know, this is, you know, some of the other synonyms you might hear kicked around is a healthcare proxy or a healthcare agent or a durable power of attorney for healthcare, but it all means the same thing. Um, a few other things about a healthcare surrogate, 
A, you want to make sure that the healthcare surrogate understands the person's values and wishes. We've talked about that a lot. Um, and, and the second piece is you want to make sure the healthcare surrogate will act on the, the patient's wishes. Again, back to Dr. Furman's point of being kind of corrected by the patient that you know they were going to do what they thought their mom would want. And that's exactly what the purpose is. The purpose is for that person to act as if they were the patient and making these decisions. And it's not about what they want. Um, although sometimes you can give your healthcare surrogate or healthcare surrogate can be given a little bit of license to make the best decision, but, but you're really making an informed decision based off of previous conversations or more information that you have. And then you wanna make sure the healthcare surrogate is available if needed. And in my story, um, my grandmother's, you know, primary healthcare surrogate was my cousin. She wasn't available. This was before the time of everybody having cell phones and being available 24 seven. And she was in Florida. So I was the backup, but I came into that as the backup healthcare surrogate without really knowing or having these conversations. So it was really a crash course in, in how to do this. And Angelo Vlandes talks about this a lot in his book, The Conversation. But you can, you know, this is the real general, you know, overview of, of what you need to look for in a healthcare surrogate. Or, or if, if you're on this call and you might be the healthcare surrogate and you realize you might not be the best person for this, you can always think about somebody else in that, in that patient's life, you know, that would be a good choice. And, and really being open to having these conversations can help relieve some of that stress. And so the documentation piece, that, that step four. Um, in the state of Kentucky, if you're in the state of Kentucky, the Kentucky Living Will Packet is um, easily accessible. And I'm gonna put a, a website in the chat. So that's Kentucky Most Co um, Coalition's website. You can download the Kentucky Living Will Packet there or from the Attorney General's website. Um, this is going to be a very basic in, in terms of very, very simple. The living will of the packet needs to be completed by a patient who is able to make decisions for themselves, um, but it, it is pretty simple. The most form, which is a medical order for scope of treatment, is really for people who are in advanced stages of illness, and it needs to be completed um, by a healthcare provider. Um, the nice thing about the most form, and I'll talk a little bit about the differences in a moment, um, the most form can be completed by a, a healthcare surrogate if the patient is un unable. So we'll talk a little bit about the, the differences, but they're really companion, art um, companion documents that help articulate this and put this in writing so people can really get their wishes honored and met if they're unable to speak for themselves. So this honoring piece, you know, that, 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 that step of, you know, making sure that the forms and the wishes are, well, it's really the wishes, making sure that the wishes are honored. Um, you wanna make sure that the surrogate and the documentation is easily accessible. Uh, best practices for this is to put it on the refrigerator. So, you know, the documentation is on the refrigerator. It can also go into the patient's um, medical record, so it can go in. It, it can go into the electronic medical record if, if they're in their primary healthcare provider. Um, so here at the University of Louisville, we're getting um, a system that it should be transportable between the their primary care provider and a hospital. So like I, I got my, my provider is through Norton, so I can have my advanced directive. In, in the system at Norton. So if I'm ever in the system, people would be able to accept, um, access this and know what my wishes are. But it's really best to have it in two, you know, basically in a written document and also in an electronic medical record if available. So attending healthcare professionals need to know about it and the healthcare system, ideally, again, this is, you know, if this goes into the system, this is available so people there's multiple steps of redundancy. So the surrogate knows the information, um, they have it in a written form, and then it's in a, available in the electronic medical records. So people are up to date and really know how to honor these wishes. And that's the, the important piece is that 
when it comes time or, or, or it's needed, that person's wishes are honored. So reviewing this, again, this last step in terms of, you know, you've elicited it, you've you reflected on your values, you've documented this and had this conversation with your providers and with your healthcare surrogates. Um, sometimes, you, you know, sometimes you're gonna review it before you honor it. So, but when do you review it? So periodically, especially if there's changes in healthcare status, changes in treatment preference, um, you can always change your mind. Um, the patient can always change their mind in terms of what treatments they wanna receive. Um, changes in surrogate or healthcare provider. So if there's a, a, if you realize that the person you chose is your healthcare surrogate or the, the healthcare surrogate change their, changes their mind, you can find you know, and, and document this again in a new form or if there's change in providers, um, but really continue to invite questions and think about what level of care, what type of treatment that person would wanna receive um, if they were unable to speak for themselves. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the different types of forms between the, the advanced, the living will and the most form, but it, it, so far, are there any questions um, either here or on Facebook? Here, here meaning Zoom. Okay, so some resources. Um, clearly, University of Louisville Traeger Institute um, is, you know, we would be more than happy to answer questions. Dr. Furman and myself would always be, you know, happy to answer questions. The Kentucky Most Coalition, we are a statewide coalition that's working to educate around the most form. I'll talk a little bit more about the differences and what the most form um, provides between the, the living will and the most but we really have a lot of these resources on our website. We have the conversation project on our website, as well as some other national organizations that are directed towards education and resources around advanced care planning. But we really do hope that you're going to, you know, engage in these conversations. And I, I really want to transform the narrative that this is a difficult conversation into, um, a conversation that we are engaging in and, and becoming more comfortable having. Um, I talked about, and, and, I, and I realized that I changed this presentation a little bit. So the living will in the state of Kentucky, it, it's, it's very straightforward. It's written by, um, by lawyers, no offense to lawyers. So it's a, but it's a little, you know, it's a little jargon, jargony, I guess. Um, but what it does is it helps you appoint a healthcare surrogate. It, it helps you outline you know, very broad treatment goals. So it's basically the, the way it's framed is full, full measures, limited measures, or comfort measures only. Um, and then you can sign up, you know, basically to decide whether you'd be an organ or tissue donor. And it, in order for it to be valid, it needs to be signed by either two witnesses or a notary public. And the patient, the, per, the person that the form is for, must be able to complete it and must be able to sign it. And so the living will is, is pretty straightforward, but the patient or the person who signed, you know, completing the form needs to be able to complete it themselves. Um, if the person is adamant, they do not want to be resuscitated. Um, if, 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 unless they're in a facility, unless they're in a long-term care facility or they are in a hospital, that do not resuscitate order is not going to be honored unless they have a secondary form. And so the secondary forms are either an EMS for DNR form, so a do not resuscitate form for EMS, or a MOST form allows first responders to honor that do not resuscitate order and basically allow that person to have a natural death. I'm, I'm really fond of the MOST form because it goes into greater detail about levels of treatments. And I also really think that it's a great form if someone is, it has chronic, um, you know, de degenerative illness and <laughs> is uh, basically unable to speak for themselves because a healthcare surrogate can sign it on their behalf as long as it doesn't conflict with an existing advanced directive. So if someone, if, if you're if, if you're someone's healthcare surrogate and they do not have an existing living will and they were no longer able to complete a living will, you can complete a most form on their behalf. 
and it gives you greater flexibility in terms of going into details about the level of treatment they receive. And it also um, is, a, is portable outside of, of a healthcare setting and it should be honored across all settings. So what and questions do you have? Um, so you have a question regarding end of life and palliative care. Janice, feel free to, you can ask um, here and if, and if myself or Dr. Furman can't answer, we can definitely refer you to someone Okay. So, Jan. Okay. Yes. Um, this, I, I my mother, uh, we went through this process with my mother who uh, did pass away. And uh, so, in the hospice setting, she received um, morphine. And I, I just have some ongoing guilt feelings about that because it was almost as if, um, it's going to sound crass. I'm a little hard. I, I, I don't know if I have eloquent enough language, but it almost is as if we were putting her to sleep. And so I just have some guilt feelings about that. I just, and I didn't know if this was the format to help have some help resolving that, or I, I'd be very interested to hear your perspective on that, but I don't mind contacting you later. Well, Janice, no, I think that this is Dr. Furman. I think that's a good um, question to bring up to the group because you're not the only one that thinks that. And so I think it's good to kind of bring it up with everybody. And I've actually, um, you know, in hospice and palliative care, there's this principle of double effect. I mean, it's not just in hospice. It's, a, it's an ethical principle that's out there all the time. And so the intent of the medicine of morphine is for, it helps with pain and it helps with shortness of breath. So if someone's in pain, you can use morphine or someone's really having a hard time breathing, they're struggling to breathe and can't catch their breath. Morphine helps them relax, take a deep breath. It dilates their arteries, they get better oxygenation. So morphine helps for those two things. And so that's why your mom got morphine was for her pain or her shortness of breath. But what might happen sometimes when people get morphine is they do get sleepy. But I've had people driving their cars, walking around on high doses of morphine and it, they're not sleepy at all. So what happens is over time, your body gets used to the morphine and you're not sleepy. But what happens with dying patients is they don't have time to kind of get used to it. So they get sleepy and they die. But if they weren't dying, they would not die. They would just get sleepy at first and then their body would get used to it and they'd be fine. So what happens is, is the reason that she got sleepy is because she was dying, you know, not because of the morphine, right? So the principle of double effect is the reason we gave the morphine was for pain and shortness of breath, but the double effect, I mean, maybe she did die sooner because of the morphine, because what happens with the morphine is you do get sleepy. And once you get sleepy, then you don't eat and drink. And then you, if you can't eat and drink, you die. So, but there's lots of research and, and Justin said like people with morphine and with hospice and palliative care actually live longer because you get your pain controlled and your symptoms controlled and you live longer. So it's very doubtful that she died any sooner because of the morphine, but families feel this guilt, like, oh my gosh. And I, and doctors feel this guilt. Like I totally remember giving a patient morphine and then they died. And like, so did I kill the patient? nurses have, I mean, the nurses are the ones that are pushing the morphine. So nor, nurses have this awful guilt, like they actually push the morphine in the patient's eyes. So did they kill the patient? You know, so it's a good human. And I, I discussed this with my mentors and my faculty and I was like, oh my God, did I kill the patient? And they're like, you always, it's always good to think it through. Like if you ever question, am I doing the right thing? Well, you should get out of medicine, right? Because you always want to question, like, did I do the right thing and think about it and think how you could do better. But the principle of double effect is that if you're doing things for one purpose and that other purpose has happens, it's okay because you're not doing it to hasten people's death. You're not giving them morphine so they'll die quicker or to kill a patient. You're giving them morphine for pain and symptom control. So as long as you're giving it for the right reasons, then the double effect reason is okay. And, and it, it can happen that way. But it's a normal feeling to feel guilty. And I think all of us should feel a little, you always want to just think, did I do the right thing and question it? But let me tell you, you did the right thing for your mom to get morphine because if she didn't, she would have had pain and shortness of breath. And no one wants to die in pain and shortness of breath. Does that help explain it? Or Yes, that helps tremendously. I really appreciate you addressing that. There, there were some other complex issues that um, I don't mind. I would love to just talk through um, privately with you. Um, but it does, it, that does help tremendously. And I, I do appreciate
appreciate that. I I would imagine she, I mean, she had a lot of anxiety. And so I imagine she would have been very frightened if she had struggled uh, more. And so I, I do appreciate you addressing and, and Justin Thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. And Justin did put my um, email in there. So feel free to email me. And but I think the whole healthcare system, I mean, that's and that what you're what you're saying is this guilt and this fear is why people do not get doctors are afraid to write for the morphine and nurses are afraid to give the morphine. And so that's why people do die of the pain and symptoms. Because I'm looking here at medical students and residents that I have with me, because a lot of doctors and nurses and healthcare professionals are not taught about morphine and taught palliative care. And so they don't know what to do. And so they're afraid so they don't do anything. So and then families need it need to have this, you need to have this conversation with your families because now this, this, this patient's daughter is still feeling guilty. And maybe if the doctor or the nurse or somebody at the time had explained it better, she wouldn't still be hanging on to this guilt, right? Mm -hmm. So it's our job to help explain it in the right way. And but yeah, I'll be happy to talk to you. Yeah, thank you so much. That um, you feel better. You're welcome. I appreciate that. You know, understandably, these are really, very difficult issues. Yeah, and, and it's good that we all take it seriously because I think if we ever get cavalier about it, that's when we need to get out of medicine, you know? Right, right. And, so, thank you. And, and Janice, like, I, I think part of, like, what the importance of these conversations are and really this whole series is being, prepared, you know, being prepared to make these decisions um, recognizing that, you know, there are things I regret doing with my grandmother that, you know, I can't take it back. But what I hope is that I can make better decisions in the future. So when I'm making decisions with my parents or I'm making decisions for my spouse or even for myself, I can be making better decisions. And I mean, I think we can all look at, you know, our lives and see that, you know, there, there's things that you would do differently, you know, when you were 20, if you knew what you knew now, right? So, you know, I, I think as we learn, we, we can change our behavior. I mean, I think some of you talked to an elder law attorney in one of the previous um, conversations. I mean, there's things that from that conversation that I would have done differently with my grandmother, you know, in conversations we would have had about resources and about access to resources and, and made decisions that would have, you know, changed her care a lot. And so I, I think that that's part of the, you know, the learning experiences. Unfortunately, we most of the time or sometimes don't learn, um, you know, until we're in the situation. So, you know, I, I think that that's a, a good learning point is to just realize that a little forgiveness for the mistakes or for the things we don't understand and then, you know, learn from it and, and, and make better decisions in the future or more informed decisions. Maybe it's even, maybe it's not better decisions, it's more informed decisions. So Tahisha or anyone, do you have any questions or anything you'd like to um, discuss before we wrap up? Um, I do not, I don't see any other questions in the chat, but I did wanna give you and Dr. Furman an opportunity to give a final statement before we end today's session. I'll let Dr. Furman have it. Oh, great. Well, I just wanna say thank you for hosting this um, because I think you're right. You just, the more you have these conversations and the more you can plan ahead, and, um, and just be proactive instead of reactive, instead of like a crisis and emergency. Um, and the more I tell you, I'm sitting here with residents and physicians and medical students with me, sometimes the family and the, and the caregivers and the patient have to demand it from the doctor. Sometimes the doctor is not gonna do this and they don't even know what you're talking, the, the, the doctor doesn't even know about the most form. So you have to educate your doctor sometimes, which I think sometimes, Patients really feel bad about that. Like, you know, the doctor should know everything, but the doctor does not know everything. A lot of doctors were not taught this in medical school and residency. So it's okay to, I am, I am uh, uh, empowering you to be a palliative care provider for yourself. And so you have to advocate for yourself sometimes and get what you need. But thank you. I think that's it for me. Justin, any other things or anything else we should? Um, somebody chimed in the chat and they, they got on late and will this be available to watch later? So Tahisha or Peyton, um, I know this was recorded, so I'm, I'm hoping this can be shared. 
Yes, I was going to say that in my final remarks, um, this, this whole session has been recorded and you will receive a copy of this on Monday by email as long as you registered. So I, I definitely want to take a moment to thank Justin and Dr. Furman for being with us today. I want to take a moment to thank each of you for listening and participating with us today. We appreciate you taking some time out to learn a little bit about having these conversations. And um, when you receive your video on Monday. You can watch it as many times as you want, rewind it, fast forward to the part you missed and be able to um, view it again. So with that, everyone, please have a great weekend and take care.